Good morning. Thanks for being here with me today. So the, the last couple of years in tech have been filled with workers speaking out against uh, their employers for contracts with ICE and other government agencies. Um, on Twitter and Facebook, uh, abuse and harassment is still prevalent. Meanwhile, gig workers have protested low wages. And in the midst of all of this, diversity and inclusion is still moving at a glacial pace in the, <laughs> in the industry. So there's, uh, there's a lot going on. But um, Ellen, what do you, what's the most pressing issue for, that's on your mind right now? I think it's tech values. And that's why I'm glad we're talking a little bit about ethics today. It's the idea that people are running these companies, they're thinking about, I think it seems like they're just focused on wealth generation for themselves, and they're not thinking about what's happening to the people around them and what's happening to all the people that they're um, kind of responsible for. And like, there's no corporate governance, there's no, you know, there's just this failure of all of these tech companies to take into account the consequences of their products, of their actions, of their um, lack of values. Tracy, what about for you? What's, what's on your mind right now? Great question. <laughs> um, I'm worried a lot about the impact of technology on society, uh, where tech is now so pervasive everywhere, and yet a lot of people still don't understand what technology actually is and what the impacts of it are, and things like our democracy, um, how we communicate with each other. Um, technology is woven into the fabric of economics, society, and I don't think we fully contextualize the technology industry. Uh, where for a long time, it was just a, a small part of society. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a bit of this attitude that um, we're the renegades or we're the underdogs, and now tech is very dominant and needs to be much more accountable to what it's doing. Yeah, and I mean, I guess even just looking back over the last year, I mean, in, Ellen, in your mind, I mean, what's, what's one of the most like, egregious examples of just a blatant lack of ethics in tech? Well, I think the easiest one right now is Juul, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at, you know, you know, Tracy and I were talking about, like, you have to look at all the stakeholders, and you, know, you, you look at your customers, and what are you doing to your customers, and how are you thinking about them, and all of a sudden you're going to bring in kids and get them addicted, and they're your customer base to grow, and you're going to target them through advertising, through having kids try to reel other kids in, and then you're going to tell people that you're actually this ethical company that's mm -hmm. trying to help prevent people from smoking, right? So that, I think Juul is the easiest one to, to think about right now. Mm -hmm. Tracy, what about for you? I would say Theranos is pretty bad as well. Well, it's kind of wild. I totally forgot about them. It just shows how much has happened <laughs> that I'm like already past Theranos, it's but like go on. If you're trying to help people in the medical capacity and actually misleading them, potentially even causing death if you're you know, recommending the wrong things, like that's, that's pretty bad. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, so those are definitely examples of, it's, it has more intent with it. And so like, what about the... The, the scenarios where it's more like unintended consequences, maybe like Facebook potentially, though you could argue at this point they, they know what's happening on their platform. Yeah, I, I think it's hard to say there is an intent at this stage, right? It's like unconscious bias. Is it really unconscious anymore? It's, you know, the, the use of this data to manipulate elections just um, for the sake of bringing in more ad dollars and more eyeballs is... I think it's egregious. I think it's like, at this point, it's hard to say that they can't control it. I do think there's like a place for regulation because they have had the ability and they have chosen not to, to do anything about it. And I think that goes to um, you know, data collection, like what kind of data are they collecting? How are they using it? How are they um, selling it? And what controls are they putting on, on other people who use it? And then where is this data, where do um, users generating content lead them to. So this, so it's like the path into white supremacy, the path into fake news, all of it is on these platforms. And Facebook isn't the only one. It's on YouTube, it's on Reddit, it's on um, Twitter. Like, they have to start being held accountable, as Tracy said earlier. Like, these are your actions, and it's not just intent. Like, you know, it's the impact of your actions as well. 
Yeah, and I mean, so yeah, you mentioned Reddit, and I mean, yeah, you were the the former CEO of of Reddit. How long how long were you CEO at Reddit again? Under a year. Under a year, and so I, I distanced myself from that. <laughs> Not even like, a year. Let me get out of here as fast as possible. But um, so I mean, obviously, like Reddit, some like there's there's a lot going on on Reddit, good and bad. I mean, as as CEO of Reddit for less than a year, I mean, how did you kind of grapple with um, Reddit's role? In, in society and just the the ethics or maybe lack of ethics that kind of emerge through some of those. Yeah, um, I think it's easy to kind of say, all right, we're going to be this free speech platform, and it just kind of keeps your hands, you know, at a superficial level clean, right? I'm allowing anything to be on my platform, and that was the way that the founders had created it, and that was what had happened for a long time. But then you started to see. Um, more and more bad stuff happening as it scaled, and as it scaled, the bad stuff happening got much worse. All of a sudden, you had like much bigger hordes of people coming after individuals on the platform. And I think, like you, you know, there were a few things that happened on the platform that really gave employees pause. And one of them was um, Sunil Tripathi be became targeted by the platform as a Boston Marathon bomber, and you know, you have this random innocent kid who all of a sudden these hordes of people are saying that he's the bomber with absolutely no evidence. And that was something that was very, um, you know, it was just disturbing. It was, it, it, you know, to be part of a platform that enabled people to do that um, without consequence. And then the second one was uh, the, I forget, like celeb gate where, where people stole nude photos off of the iCloud, and then mm -hmm. started posting them right. of celebrities. And we, we said, you know, we're just posting links. We're not responsible for content. We allow whatever people want to go out there, and that's free speech. Uh, so for me, it was really like, hey, we need to protect our users' privacy. That's been one of our core values from starting Reddit. And as employees, nobody was comfortable being the platform with these nude photos. And we're the only ones after you know a certain point, who were linking or you know the pathway to get to these nude photos, so that became all we were. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, it was like, okay, we've got these patches of bad stuff, but overall, we're a good site. And when it came to Celebgate, we were just bad stuff because you couldn't get to the good stuff because we couldn't keep the servers running to serve the bad stuff. So we started taking stuff down. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea that you could actually be responsible for the for the consequences of the speech on your platform was somewhat new to us. And the idea that, hey, if you want to have free speech, everybody has to be able to have a voice. And when you're running people, when you're allowing people to run people off a platform, that's not really free speech for everyone. Yeah, and so so Tracy, I mean, you so your your startup block party actually aims to to tackle abuse and harassment on platforms like Reddit, like Facebook, like Twitter. Could you talk a little bit about how, how you aim to do that through Block Party? Yeah, so with Block Party, we are very focused on the end user, so the people who end up as the targets of abuse and harassment. We're thinking about what are the tools that would be helpful to these people, uh, so there's better controls over what they're seeing, um, being able to have other people help out, um, being able to collect evidence better. So there's a set of things that I think platforms need to do and be more responsible to. Um, at the same time, I think for the individuals, there's just m more choice and more tools needed. Uh, so I think there's, um, if, we're, if we're talking about like, the freedom of speech thing on like a bigger platforms, uh, we're trying to help users have the freedom to not hear the abusive content yeah. and just have more control over that experience. And would, would you ever consider, I, I know it's early days for the company, but would you ever consider working more closely with the likes of Facebook and Twitter and Reddit to enable them to offer those tools to their users or like form some type of partnership or do you envision yourself kind of? Yeah, that? absolutely. I think there's a very big ecosystem here and we need to work together to solve these problems because they're multifaceted. The, um, the bad actors are extremely sophisticated. Some of them, you have some garden variety trolls, but you also have very sophisticated bad actors, and I think we need to be coordinated in the response to, to this. Yeah, and okay, so I think it was yeah within the last month, um, 
uh, Build Tech We Trust, um, an organization that you're both part of, kind of um, launched or announced itself. And then you're also both uh, co-founding members of Project Include. Ellen, of course, you're, you're at the helm. And how do, you, how do you see those two organizations working together or sort of like complementing each other? I think um, we have different focuses. So Project Include is very much focused on like how do we change tech startups so that they become healthy, diverse, and inclusive big companies. So it's focused on um, making sure that companies have diversity internally and have inclusion internally and there's equity and representation at all levels and in all functions. And we use data and you know convenings of CEOs to push that forward and heavy advocacy. Um, Build Tech We Trust is focused on deplatforming hate and really focused on working um, to call attention to these issues, um, to get platforms to pay more attention, and to bring different voices to the conversation. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, so Build Tech We Trust um, started with a letter that we co-wrote um, after a series of three mass shootings in a row. Uh, there was one nearby as well like in Gilroy. And in these cases, and in many other cases, um, there are links back to radicalization, uh, the white nationalists online. And so there is accountability, there's culpability in the platforms that are enabling people to connect in these ways and become radicalized. Uh, and it's no longer just online. The online abuse and harassment is bad enough, but it's translating into real world harm, like very big harm at the scale of mass shootings. And uh, it started off with this letter. We were just thinking about like, how do we take a stand that this is not okay and start organizing. Um, so there's part of it which is putting out that stance. Um, there's some of it which is convening all the players in the ecosystem. So we're looking at who are all the people who are already doing a lot of hard work um, in different communities. How do we bring people together? Um, how do we galvanize more people to take part um, from tech workers to the CEOs, leaders, investors? Um, also thinking about what is our interaction with politics um, and what sorts of platforms might we want to encourage like, political candidates to be running on. And Ellen, you had mentioned earlier that kind of the number one thing on your mind right now is, is values. And so, so through your work with, with Project Include and like working with startups, like how are you, like how do you get them to think about values like as it, as it relates to like DNI, as it relates to ethics, as it relates to you know, the, even the potential unintended consequences of these platforms that then Build Tech We Trust is kind yeah. of focused on right now? I think it's hard to instill values in people from the outside, right? For a lot of people, their values are formed through decades of experience, through companies that they first started working at and, and role models. So to come in from the outside as this nonprofit and try to say, these are your values, you need to... Um, you need to be diverse and inclusive and you need to think about all of your employees and all of your customers and you need to think about the world at large. It's, it's, you know, sometimes it's an uphill battle. So we focus on working with companies where the CEOs are already oriented towards diversity and inclusion and we can help them. We can help them by bringing them a group of peer CEOs to talk with and figure out ways to experiment to solve the problem. We can help them by giving them data on what their employee base looks like and what the sentiment levels of different groups are. And we can help them by providing like all sorts of information and other data and recommendations to help them move forward. But this idea that um, you can change somebody's values easily through like short interactions, I think that's really hard. I think that's like when we started Project Include, we're like, oh, this unconscious bias training for 45 minutes, that was like the solution to diversity and inclusion du jour five years ago. Like I think everybody's realized that actually does not work at all. And you need these like ongoing trainings, you need ongoing interaction and you need to measure and hold people accountable. So I think a big part of it is like, teaching people and it's through like conversations like this, it's through people's books, it's through people telling their stories. And I think what's changed the environment and change, is starting to change people's values and you see more and more people putting inclusion as one of their company values is because people are starting to talk about like all of the problems that they've had that you know have 
made them less likely to talk, that have made them quit their companies, that have made them quit tech, and people are starting to listen. Yeah, and yeah, so I mean, people have definitely been speaking out more um, against their companies. They've been sharing their stories and um, and also even just more like employee activism. So yeah. um, in light of employees at uh, software startup Chef uh, speaking out against the company's contract with ICE, the company actually ended up deciding not to renew its contract. And what do you think it will take for other tech companies to follow suit? Do you have an answer? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's it's like, I'm not sure that it's fully taken hold yet, mm -hmm. right? I think if you look at Google, like they ended up like pushing out a bunch of employees who had organized right, right the walkouts. And if you look at Amazon, they haven't done very much. Kickstarter kind of blocking a union efforts. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the kind of people really starting to think about like these long-term pushes and just continuing and not giving up. Um, you know, Google did change some of its policies, I think around forced arbitration, mandatory arbitration. Mm -hmm. So there are little things that are happening. I think it's continuing to do things. I think it's a lot of it is the press, right? It's the press paying attention. It's, you know, having the, it, things made visible to the world stage that get companies to change. I don't think they're going to change on their own. I think their values are set and I think their founders are still there and it makes it very hard to change internally. So it's got to be external pressure. So it's the press, it's the employees um, creating internal pressure through external forces and then potentially regulation. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, we are still living in a capitalist system, so I think the economic incentives are still overriding. That being said, other things can play into that, so really bad press can hurt companies economically, and so then they'll start to address it. Um, the delete Uber hashtag was a really interesting case of, kind of like organizing around uh, a lot of um, unhappiness about various Uber practices, mm -hmm. um, but it actually had a measurable impact on installs and, and usage. Um, obviously, many other things are going on with Uber, but I think that kind of um, consumer broad-based uh, like bad press did push Uber to think a little bit harder about what they were doing. Yeah, so just more bad press, essentially, <laughs> can, can kind of help move move it along and, of course, employees speaking out and right. protesting and I mean because that's the thing I mean we do see some change happening but it's not like speaking out doesn't necessarily lead to change sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't so I guess I'm wondering what else can be done to push companies in the direction of, of ethical decision making litigation right <laughs> we'll get sued and that is a big wake up call because then all of a sudden, I mean, there's a reason why people want arbitration. It's to keep things outside of the press, mm -hmm. to keep things outside of the public's mind, and then also to not have any outside forces making any kinds of decisions. So when you have actual litigation, that's public, and then you have you know, a judge or a jury making decisions, and also you, you have another public forum where people outside your company have information that can help them make decisions. Mm -hmm. There's a transparency to it. One other thing for tech companies, especially, is like recruiting is so important and being able to retain good people. Um, and this again ties into the economic arguments for companies to care. If there's enough uh, employees or candidates who make a, a strong stand saying, I'm not going to stand for this, I will actually leave the company in protest, mm -hmm. or I will no longer work at a company that does these things, then there's a sort of like recruiting pressure that companies may respond to. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and so Ellen, you've you've long called for for Trump to be kicked off of Twitter, and he's still there. Do you is it? Do you think it's unethical for Twitter to keep him on its platform? So Laura Gomez and I wrote a piece over, I guess it's in January of 2017, I think, yeah. or February 2017, um, saying that um, Trump was violating all the rules and he was causing the online and real life harassment that Tracy mentioned. I, I, I do think it's a question of values and I think it's a question of ethics to create these exceptions because you want to drive this growth that you want to use to fuel your stock price and to fuel recruiting and to fuel this capitalism that's driving um, 
all sorts of decisions without thinking about the long-term direction of where your platform is going. Jack talks about this public square and where you, you have like this digital version of the public square, but you know, people aren't screaming at you on the public square. Like they're not <laughs> calling you racist things. They're not throwing pictures of like horrible things and they're not, um, I, I don't want to be in a public square like that, right? And I don't want to have a public square that's digital create these horrible events in real life. And mm -hmm. if, you know, and if you're part of a platform that is pushing all sorts of, um, you know, mass shootings or hate or, um, you know, these ideas that are really just based on hate and, uh, and turning them into action, I don't think that's an ethical decision. I don't think that's a values-driven decision. I don't think that's creating a good public square. I don't think that's a, doing a service for your users who are from the groups that are being hated on. I think you really have to think about like your whole community. You have to think about the types of conversations you want to have. And it's not this, oh, we can't take you know, um, conflict on the site, but it's what kind of conflict are you willing to take? Are, you know, where is the line between meaningful conversation and just you know, outright harassment? Like using the F word and the C word and the N word, that's not a conversation, right? That's not an exchange of ideas. And I don't think people think enough about like, what do they want their platforms to be? What do they want their platforms to encourage? Yeah. I don't think any of us would say that there are very easy decisions here. Like there's no bright lines that we can mm -hmm. point to. And we've already seen some platforms actually take a stance on the sort of thing. So Pinterest just stopped serving any results for anti-vax search queries. And we get some criticism like, well, where do you draw the line? How do you determine what things you're going to block the search results for? And Pinterest's response was just, we know that this is causing harm mm -hmm. to our community health. We know that the science is there, that vaccines work, and we're just not going to allow this to, this sort of misinformation to proliferate on our platform. That doesn't necessarily give us the blueprint for every decision in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, there's a pretty clear decision that Pinterest could make. Um, Cloudflare took down uh, was it Daily Stormer. Right. Like, well, this shouldn't be our responsibility as like a provider of like, basic in internet infrastructure. But if nobody else is going to act, then we are going to act because we don't want to enable this. And uh, in the statement that they posted, they said, we don't want to be making these kinds of decisions, but sometimes you just have to make these calls, even if they're not perfectly generalizable. I think some of the inaction from platforms like Twitter is this um, attempt to design the perfect system of rules. Mm -hmm. And they're hamstrung by trying to come up with this perfect system of rules. Um, and in the meantime, there is a lot of harm being done. Yeah, and as you're, as you're in the earlier days of running your own startup, I mean, how do you think about some of these issues? And I guess I'm wondering, are you ready to draw the line around certain issues when, when necessary? Yeah, we've spoken actually about things like which service providers we right. want to use. Um, so there are some companies uh, that we were looking at using, but knowing the stories of the founders, um, what they've done in previous companies, we chose to not work with them. Not that it's a very big statement, but just like, as, as people um, in a company, we want to feel good about all the choices we're making, where we're spending money. We still have to be practical. So if there's only one service provider for something that we really need and we need to run our business, then we'll use it. But if there's any alternatives, we'll, we'll go for those. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's always a practicality, um, especially with startups, you make so many hard trade-offs. But whenever we can, we're trying to bias towards doing things that we feel like we can stand by ethically. Yeah, and I mean, also even just when it comes to deciding who to accept funding from. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, Ellen, I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, you obviously advise your, your startups around, around funding. And I mean, do you encourage them to look at like, the LPs and the fund, like how do you advise them around those topics and making sure that they're not taking money from the wrong people? Yeah, I think it's hard, you know, to know you want to have your values aligned with your funders. It's, um, you know, it's, it's getting harder because a lot of the funders that have a lot of money actually don't have great values, right? You're looking at the money from 
what is it, MBS, the um, Saudi Arabian mm -hmm. um, giant fund that's been investing in a lot of companies, you know, thinking about taking money from Russia, where is that money going? Uh, and it's, you know, are your values aligned? Are they predictable in what they're going to have you do? Or are you just taking money from wherever you can get it? In which case, like, you've already had really high valuation because, you know, you don't want to give up that much dilution to an entity that you don't agree with and that might have you do things or might be doing things that you're not um, in agreement with. Yeah. And also, who do you want to be making money for yeah, if right. you're successful? Do you want to be putting that back towards the Saudi fund? Maybe not. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely a lot of decisions to be made. <laughs> and just, yeah, thinking about how those decisions are going to like have a greater impact on, on your company and our society. So. Yeah, lots to think about. So yeah, we're unfortunately out of time, but thank you for, for being up here with me and thanks so much. All Megan. That. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody.